Um, my name is Simon Roberts. I'm the sales director for PPC Africa. Um, we deal with pre-termination and focus very much on the last drop in the FTTH installation. So what I'll ask now is just the panel just to give a quick introduction of themselves, starting with Quenga here, and uh, just work down, and then we'll get into the topic. Uh, my name is uh, Quenga Khano. I run the stakeholder relations department for Dark Fiber Africa. Uh, we are an open access uh, fiber network provider. My name is uh, Eugene Slobert. I'm from Fiber. Uh, Metro Fiber Networks, and uh, I'm basically the head of uh, planning, strategic planning, and projects for the company. Sean Fantonde, I'm with a company called Fiber Up, CEO. Um, we specialize in FTTX fiber deployments and uh, projects. Uh, Rowan Luck from a company called ATEC Systems and Technologies. We're a fiber to the home company. Um, I head up the Fiber Network Division, uh, Chief Operations Officer. Great. Thanks, gents. So, we were talking about this, and I, and I think before we start, I, I'm going to read a little quote because I, I like my quotes. Challenges are not the problem. Um, rather, it is your assessment of them, and it is within your power to change them. Um, that was from one of the, the Roman empires, uh, Marcus Aurelius, back in AD 58. And I think what we wanted to do was kind of look at the different problems that we face and then look more so at how the gentlemen here have all chosen to overcome them and to put them down. Because every one of the fellows here is successful in their business um, and delivered on a total end-to-end -end fiber solution. So what we did is we looked at the problem and we broke it down into four sections. So primarily we looked at how do you propose a deployment? Where do you take it? Where do you go? Um, we then looked at how you design that network and the challenges faced. Then look at the execution and build and then finally the customer connect. So you're really looking from the start of where, you, where, where do you go and by the end of how do you connect. So really we're going to start with Rohan and, and, and just ask in terms of the proposed deployment because Rohan looks predominantly at suburbs or really at estates in terms of choosing those. So uh, I think what do you see as the challenges, Rohan, in terms of which estate do you choose and why? Well, it's amazing how our sales pitch has changed in the last, we've been doing this for about 12 years now. So we've initially had to first explain to people what this fiber actually is and why do they need it. And it's great because, you know, you have all these things. Now our pitch has changed to how do we get this in and how do we get it in fast and how do we make it affordable and how do we deploy and get going. And typically we have a lot of early adopters in an estate and there's usually a handful of them. But they don't all live in the same street. They don't even live anywhere, location, anywhere near to each other. So there's costs of build, there's, there's economies of scale, there is, essentially you've got to find a, uh, you've got to get to a needs analysis and say, okay, how many units are there? What do we think the uptake is going to be? Um, and we're typically only focusing on the voice and the internet part of it now. But now you've got to make these models feasible. Okay, how can we leverage on security? How can we leverage on OTT? How can we leverage on... And the markets that we're talking to, a lot of these guys don't understand an absolute, any word that we're even saying. So we need to now go and say to them, these are things that you can and can't. Um, property values, yes it can, if it's an enabler. We've got guys in the market that are competing with us, which makes our lives easy and difficult um, because they have access to models that people may or may not have. But typically focusing on a gate of the state, the security is almost always the end. 50% um, of their budget will always go to, to a security. And now it's a case of, okay, we have to get comms and connections to a perimeter that may be five or six kilometers long. There's no power out there, but fiber moves at the speed of light. So if you're gonna be, be deploying a fiber network for that, then it's a case of, okay, add on a couple of extra strands and off you go. That at least then starts the conversation. Um, but building those needs analysis is immensely, and it takes up a lot of time. So how do, you, uh, how do you get to that first stage of thinking, oh, I'm going to go to that community, or I'm going to go to that gated aspect, and, and I'm going to go and visit the site manager of that particular one? What's, what's your driving factor? So typically it's, it starts on a, um, we look where the networks are in terms of a, of a, back, of a backhaul point of view. It's all fine and well signing up somebody in the middle of Hilton, for argument's sake. But if you can't backhaul and you can't give them a proper connection, you can't give them a proper service, almost dead in the water before you've even started. So you typically want to look where the networks are, and they are saturated in terms of um, 
accountability and, and, and back all that type of thing. And it's knocking on the door and saying, guys, do you have a service? Do you want a service? Um, and it pretty much starts from there. We do brownfields um, as well as we do greenfields. So we like to try and get involved on developer stage as well. Because of the solutions that we deliver, they are exactly that. The, the, the start of the relationship starts with knocking on that door. And it's a five year, 10 year relationship. It's not a box drop. So it's a case of Mr. Developer, have you thought about just when you dig a hole, just put the sleeves in for us, please. This is what a man almost looked like. And I'll come back whenever and we'll come and do the installation type of thing. But you have to just be knocking on the doors and seeing that, that luckily with the, the rollout of fiber to the home as far as it's come out now, people are coming to us. Yeah. And unfortunately, people are coming to us when they've been to three or four other operators that won't do their builds because they're too small. They can't get the economies of scale to work, or they're not where the networks are. Um, but like I said, there's a, a, every there's a hundred different variations. Mm. Like I say, we have to make sure that we can find things to work and make it a long-term solution. No one wants to start something and then it kind of half works and then it's a really bad experience. Yeah. So. so I guess if you look at it from that aspect, what we do is maybe maybe just ask Quena. In, in terms of DFA, we were talking about Parkhurst earlier. I guess what Rowan's saying there is that you go and find a specific project that you then go and deliver. When you tender for a process and then you, do you then, does that drop on your lap in terms of developing that, that opportunity? Because somebody obviously within DFA scopes that and says, do you know what, we can, we can do that tender, we can do that project. Well, do you think, is there a differentiation between tendering and then going to find that specific market and then delivering? I think when you tender, you have, you have the, the option decide yourself is this a feasible area or not. Mm. I think that's the, 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 the positive side of tendering instead of going out and uh, perhaps uh, going out and, 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 and your salesman running around trying to find new sales for you. And things like that. So tendering makes it much more easier to choose where to go and where not to. Unless it's park hills to <laughs> Park <Parkview>, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess if we look at the next bit in terms of network design, so I mean, let's say you know you've got the site or you've won the tender, um, that business effectively now now needs to deliver. So I, I mean, if uh, if I may, Eugene, in terms of network design, how how do you then approach it? Let's say you know you've got you've got the customers, you've got the project, whether it be by tender or by uh, or by acquisition, as Rowan says, if you go and find a specific project. What's your drivers in terms of design? How, how do you approach that next aspect? Well, we've come a long way in that. Obviously, it started the manual process, a lot of man hours, surveys, doing that, and, and, and looking at, at the area in the most effective way to, to, to provide fiber to each unit in that area. And uh, obviously, it took a lot of time. We made a lot of mistakes. In looking back at the history, we have areas that the, the planning was not really foresighted enough to make sure everything is, is catered for that can develop in that area. Uh, during this process, we have now, in our company, moved to uh, a computer-aided software program that's on a GIS system that we basically have rules on, uh, on the, the, the sort of costing that is involved, crossing a road, digging a trench, or using existing infrastructure, or um, available aerial poles, or something like that. Build those rules with cost, and then just run, run an algorithm that is actually uh, coming up with a bill of quantities and the most effective way to plan it. And when you do a site survey after it, it is, uh, you can adapt it quite quickly. Uh, we, we looked at it and it is man hours wise where we sometimes can spend up to three to four weeks on a large area, maybe even if it's a really a large area, up to six weeks, eight weeks. Uh, once you've configured all the, the, the possible connection points on the, on the systems, it takes you about five, six minutes really to run it. So, we can do large areas now reasonably quickly and quite accurately and so on. 
And then you also work for your bill of material in terms of having to build price and a labor price. That's correct. Uh, in, in, in the system, when we, we configure it, basically all the sort of activities that you can envision or your, your, your tool list that you're using rolling out the network is already costed, mm. materials wise and so forth. And uh, uh, the, output, the output of the whole exercise is to give you a, a, a very accurate bill of quantities that you can use for the thing. And it makes provision for, for uh, the future type of, so you can provide spares already and so forth. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because, I mean, I think, you know, as, as providers of data as you guys are, traditionally everybody goes in and they talk to talk and, oh, I've got to put loads of fiber in, but you may be going with one fiber and then the rest lays down. And I always see that a lot with, with products that we sell in the local market. Where's the upgrade path for that? Because it's, to me, that seems quite a challenge to then say, well, I've, I've delivered a service, you've got a 10, 50 meg, whatever the service is that you're paying for. How do you then legislate for being able to take over the top content or deliver DSTV over fiber as, as, as a lot of the guys here do? Well, DSTV over fiber, we would like to, to avoid that when possible. <laughs> uh, no, but it is a requirement from a lot of these estates and complexes to have that sort of thing. And uh, we specifically design, uh, it costs us more, but uh, looking at the, 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 the long-term benefits in terms of the life cycle costs, the, the problems that you get, the maintenance issues, it is, it is uh, more feasible for us to provide a separate overlay of fiber for, for the TV distribution rather than to to, to, to do an RF overlay on the a, on a TV, although mm. that is a, what is being promoted quite a lot, but uh, uh, it is, it is um, quite um, labor intensive, or not labor intensive, but it's on the long run, if you have a fiber distribution right into the home, we also tend to see uh, multi-choice is not really there to, to share their revenue. To, mm. And any problems that you get with the TV system is directed to you as yeah. the fiber operator. Yeah. So that's why we try to keep it separate and, and to make a good demarcation point on that point. On that yeah, okay. Point. Services to upgrade that, obviously the, the services, the, the sort of interfaces, most of that is just configurable going up in the thing. It's equipment. Everybody is using g so that's mm. a sort of... Uh, uh, speeds that you can get, it's not a problem. In Metro Fiber, obviously, we we also have a, uh, we don't deploy OLTs really at, at estates and so on, so we uh, follow a process where we look at the large area and, and, and then establish quite a large capacity pop from where we distribute uh, fiber uh, to it. And then we try to keep the splitting splitters as near as possible to the the endpoints. Yeah. So you basically got it covered for tomorrow and uh, yeah. from where and, we uh, For open spaces, development areas, uh, we make provision. Yeah. So, so it, uh, it is a, it's a guess, guessing game. You don't know what's going to be developed there. And, uh, but uh, if you start working in large areas and you have good relationships with most of the property developers around the area, you get a good idea what sort of uh, growth is going to happen in that area. Yeah. And Rowan, if I may just, just sort of bounce back, um, the same question, because when you look at the, the gated communities, I mean, you mentioned already that security is the, one of the driving factors. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the range of the fiber obviously diminishes because once you plug it into the OLT and you've got mm -hmm. your router, the range for that can be you know, less than 30 or 40 meters. How do yep. you overcome that challenge of then being able to almost smart home the house? I guess we hear that a lot. Yeah, that's where the ISPs come in. But yep. typically we have to be forthcoming and we have to ask the question. And most people don't know. You know, they live in a fairly <coughs> big house. It's got steel structure. It's got multiple stories. It's got wine cellars and all these wonderful things. But where's the Wi-Fi going to work? Uh, you know, the, the, we put a termination device in the garage or the nearest plug point. ISP comes out and he's got a five meter patch cable. Now the router's stuck in a place where there's no Wi-Fi. So it's really a case of, is there articulation for it? And we've had to put those mechanisms into our installation parts because we're a network and an ISP. 
but on the ISP side is, Mr. Customer, have you thought about these things? Okay, we can offer you these type of things that are extra to extend your edge. Do you have conduits? Do you have cornices? Do you have all these other type of things? And typically that's always after the fact. So when we get involved on the developer side, please make sure you reticulate and put in an extra little bit of, of, of uh, conduit for us. You know, typically on the TV side because we use completely separate distributions for that. Um, but on a retrofit, it really becomes, I'd say retrofit, but it's a, an installation after the fact. Yeah. It becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, people buy things off the market, they go to incredible connection and buy this, these Wi-Fi expanders and all those type of things. That's all great until something happens. Because what they're going to do is they're going to phone us and say, listen, my Wi-Fi doesn't work. Uh, really? Okay, we'll try and see if we can help you type of thing. So it's very much an education side in terms of extending that edge. Okay. So I think if we just take it a stage further in terms of now we've, now we've analysed what we're doing, how we're going to do it. I mean, John, in terms of execution of build, I know, I know your, your business especially is involved in the contracting and the OSP. Yeah. Once the guys have selected what they want and then they've contracted you to go and build it, what's the biggest challenge you, you face in terms of one, at least getting access? I mean, I think we haven't really touched on Waylees. And yeah. I think probably you're probably one of the most gifted guys on the bench here to, to talk about Waylees and how you manage those. Yeah. Maybe you could just share a little bit on, um, on how you've tackled that. So, I mean, my colleagues here, um, uh, um, Rowan and um, Eugene, talk about gated communities and talk about ring fence areas where um, it's quite, it's not easier, it is easier to get permission from one single person as a, um, as a, a rate pay association to then go and dig up a gated community. For us, that specialised more on um, building networks with the uh, liquids, the DFAs, the intents of the world. Um, we work on public, uh, uh, public property. So therefore we need waves, and waves is probably one of the biggest um, privileges of getting going, um, because that while leave depending on um, depending on certain areas or which region you're talking about, could take anything up to two weeks, sometimes longer, depending on how difficult or how big the job is that we're doing. But while leave certainly is one of the biggest um, biggest things that that draws back. And then once you start, um, it's the it's the skills. So there's a real real shortage of skills in South Africa for companies such as ourselves, right from the bottom, right to the top, in terms of the brain drain that we've got in South Africa as well, um, where we don't find enough skills. And we might touch on the topic a little bit later, but I think this is where we can maybe get the, um, some of the firms and the more formalized um, in industry leaders and bodies to come together and provide us more of that skill more regularly, instead of intermittently per short project and that sort of stuff. So how would, you, uh, how would you address that? Because I mean, I've worked in this market for about eight or 10 years now, and the big thing I always hear is, is the lack of skills. Yeah. And then you hear all the lovely catch lines, oh, we need to empower people, we need to give them the tools. But it doesn't seem to change yet, if we're honest, all of us sat here have reasonable fiber connections. I mean, yeah. the fiber guys, or the fiber service that you get in SA is, is much more than I get back in the UK, for example. Yeah. So it is being addressed, but, but, but where do you see the shortage? Is it, is it the fact that they do the jobs, but they do it badly? Or is it that they're not doing it all, and therefore companies like yours that deliver a high service are able to succeed more? Yeah, so, so we've seen this huge boom in our industry in South mm. Africa. Mm. And because of that, um, there's not enough skill to feed all of that. And from our point of view, you know, just to develop skill for maybe in case and then fund that process is quite expensive. Yeah. And the cost drives down um, right to our level. You know, it's not just, um, not just the operators and the uh, uh, network owners that are trying to drive costs. We have to, those costs are, uh, or, or driving those costs are forced, forced onto us as well. Yeah. Um, so we've started smaller programs, uh, specifically um, um, in our company, whereby we train the trainer or in our fiber optic build teams, instead of just two per team, we might throw in another uh, assistant in there so that when the time comes, we can actually split these teams up and then build more teams. Um, so there's those type of um, 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 programs that we're running. And then there's also um, official training programs that the, um, um, that the industry bodies also can uh, help and assist with. So it may be incumbent on the FTTH people to, uh, 
TTX, sorry, to, 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 to give some assistance to try and legislate that. Yeah. But I guess from a DFA perspective, Kona, I mean, how would you address that? Because I would look at that and I kind of think, well, if I had an approved list of contractors, which you've already scoped, of course, anyway, but typically now in the market, the approved list of contractors then subcontract out. So the end work ends up getting done by somebody else. Do you find that a consideration or a concern? Uh, and I guess maybe a question to the whole panel because I'm sure you all subcontract out elements of your work. So whilst on one hand it's great to have an approval list and approved list, we suspect afterwards you would also subcontract that out. But from a DFA perspective, I mean you appreciate your So from a DFA perspective, um, we typically have a pool of contractors that uh, we've basically chosen because of their ability to roll out what we know we can't, right? Mm -hmm. um, DFA as a company runs a network. We lease space on our network, but we're not right? Um But we're, not, we're also conscious of the fact that that work now cascades down to uh, a subcontractor who would, who would then, uh, because of proximity, be best placed job. Um, so being devil's advocate, is he best place or is he, is he passing the buck because he can make more money by getting somebody else to do it? No, no, I think it, it, it only makes sense. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, if, you, if we're building a network in Bloemfontein, right, um, it, it doesn't make any sense for a contractor to, uh, to go and take a contractor from uh, Johannesburg, right? And it, it, yeah, the, sure. the, the cost for him to travel to Bloemfontein, find housing, find a best place to just go find a contractor in, 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 in Bloemfontein yeah, of course. in order to roll out the infrastructure. But I think to add on to the skills development and uh, things, so we have, uh, we have a, 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 a training facility called, uh, we call it Ugukana, right? Where we try and bridge that gap of skills try and adopt uh, people from local communities, put them through, uh, through that training facility in order to uh, get them through to fiber optic training mm. uh, and, and, and other skills that they can get through that. And we find that that, only, that doesn't only help with the divide, but it also buys us a bit of favor from the communities that we work in because um, I mean, it, to be a good corporate citizen, you need to understand what is exactly going on in the different communities you work in. Yeah, of course. And, and, and uh, give back, yeah. yeah, okay. And you, you mentioned a good point on way leaves, and I, I'm going to ask Eugene the, the, the same question. I mean, Eugene, what's, in terms of way leaves and local regulations, is that one of the biggest hurdles or the biggest challenges that, that you face at Metro Fiber in, in delivering to your customers? I think currently it's one of the hottest topics for, for the operators is the whole issue of local governments or for the road owners or the, maybe they're not the owners, they're the custodians of that area. I've heard once that the people said the problem came when they call it road reserves, they should have called it service reserves because that was another service to be there. But as it may be, that is definitely a big uh, issue. Uh, my colleague here said two weeks on, I think we experience up to a year sometimes for, 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 for a way leave approval to start digging. And very recently, there was a lot of developments in this area where, where it was just unexplainable increases in costs for the way leaves. Uh, I think there's a huge divide at this stage between the local governments, the municipalities, or the agencies, the road agencies, and the network operators. All uh, the, I can see from the point of view of the road owners or the agencies, they've got assets to protect, and there is currently, and to our own detriment, a lot of cowboys also being out there and doing, not doing the industry favor mm. on it. And uh, everybody is, 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 is running for this big, explosion on the, on the fiber and, 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 and obviously quality capabilities is lacking quite a lot. Uh, 
Yeah. And that translates to frustration at the municipalities and people at the proves that, that they take trying to take a hard stance and basically paint everybody with the same brush. Mm. So I think because there's a large gap, there's also a large opportunity. Fiverr is going to stay for a very long time still in this country. There's hundreds of villages and little towns and cities that's not been fibered yet. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity for good job creation if we can upskill down there. And it actually just calls a little bit for, for every all the parties and role players to get together and to look at the scope that is available in, and, and to allow better technologies and long liberty type of, of, of um, uh, creation of skills and capabilities that will be used. Uh, a good example that I can say, which is close to my heart, uh, I think everybody that's in the rollout of, of fiber recognize that micro trenching is definitely mm. a way to go forward and to, 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 to do it cost effective and that actually will, will enhance or will accelerate the, the rollout of fiber. But there's a huge uh, uh, fight back against that from the road agencies and for good reasons. I mean, if you look at the studies on, on these things, uh, there's not really standards, proper standards and, and specifications and in, 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 uh, um, capabilities uh, uh, to do that. Any, any contractor can almost go and rent a higher equip uh, concrete cutter and mm. cut a slot in the road and so he's doing it. And that is damaging the road and there's no issue about it. So, so I think there's a, a good opportunity for, for what I call a, a contractors, a fiber contractors association to form a regulatory body to create those skills and, and, and accreditation, uh, assist, assist um, uh, the, the, the municipalities to have proper standards in it and basically generate a lot of little small uh, self-contained units because it's not that expensive it's it is it is a couple of rands that's necessary but there's going to be a lot of work and if, if the, the municipalities comes to the party and say yes you can do micro trenching but this is my accredited mm. contractors that you should use I am sure that most of the network operators will Gladly go for that. I think, as you say, Eugene, I mean, it, it, it comes down to knowledge, isn't it? You know, knowledge is power, and, you know, yeah. as Spider Man said, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I yeah. think it's incumbent on us as, as providers and suppliers to, to do that. If, I can, if I can add to what Eugene was saying, um, there is a, yes, it's very true, there is a huge bottleneck at the municipalities when it comes to way leaves. Um, but further than <coughs> that, I mean, um, there's a huge resource issue from a Wiley point of view at the municipalities, they just haven't got the capacity to deal with all these contractors. You can imagine sitting at one municipality and now you've got six, seven operators or contractors that's applying for Wiley's and most of them on the same areas because that's where the, that's, you know, that's where they've identified where the mm. opportunity is. Um, so, so there's a huge, there's a huge shortage there of skill and resource for the municipality to manage that. But more so, also, and I th Eugene touched on it, it's the interpretation of laws, because there is some laws with regards to way leaves, and there is some guidelines. But we found, like for instance, just in Cape Town, from, from Stellenbosch to um, Paul, interpreting how these way leave rules should be um, implemented, differs. So in, in one municipality, they'd say, right, you have to, if, you, if you're on the, on the pavement or the verge, you have to reinstate the the entire village. Mm. Um, in Cape Town, for instance, also we have situations where if we do break the road, then it's going to cost us 7,000 rand per meter just to break the road. In Twane, where they've just stopped basically all trenching, um, they want 250k per wave. Now these things, and these costs, has to be absorbed somewhere. Mm. Um, and we can't push it down to the end user. So somewhere in between is where those costs are absorbed. So is there 
I mean, knowing that and the regulator and the, the local municipalities is they're not going to throw the budget to get more people. So I mean, that's building that team within a local municipality is, is not really going to happen. But I mean, as guys that all are involved in the projects, you know, we talk about open serve and open or, or shared duct and shared access. When you do a way leaf, if I understand correctly, a lot of the time the, regular, the, the municipality will ask you, is anybody else wanting to put in there? So if, in that instance, is there not a consortium bid that would overcome that obstacle or that challenge of putting it in the ground? Because then, in theory, you only open up once. Yeah. I mean, obviously, in, a, in an estate, you go in a guest row and singly, so you're not, you're not providing for anybody else. Well, it depends. I mean, it's depending on who the service providers are. It also depends on who your client is. Mm. So someone like Fiber App will now go and apply for a way leaf on behalf of MFN. He's, is he not going to go to DFA and say, we're opening up a hole here, do you want to join us, type of thing? Um, at what point? I understand what you're saying, but mm. at what point do you say, okay, we're going to open this hole up once, okay, everyone that wants to put their fiber in, please come and do it, because yeah. it's a land grab at the moment. The guys are spending the money to put the, the infrastructure in, but they want to be where everybody isn't. Of course. Um, and, oh, well, you know, these guys have already done this route, let's do a different route, whatever the case may be. Mm. So, that may not necessarily work, and what so ends up happening is the same piece of ground gets dug up all the time. Is the challenge the fact that it's a land grab and companies are getting the stuff in as quickly as they can? So the yeah. challenge is competition. Competition. It's a competition. Yeah. It's competition. Yeah. Which, is, which is not really a challenge, I mean, that's an opportunity, of course, yeah. for, for you guys to get in first and first to market. Yeah. Which, uh, in the past, has led to complacency. I mean, I think the municipalities would have not been giving the fines had the work been done to a high standard all the time. And, and I think, you know, we've talked before, on, and, and a lot of the contractors, if you have that level of, of authority and you have the level of accreditation, if you have decent contractors that don't rip up the streets and they do a job properly, because, I mean, 75% of a build is OSP and getting that fi fi fiber into the ground. Yeah. I mean, but do you think you can change that mentality? I mean, that's, that, that to me sounds like the biggest challenge. Uh, well, I, I believe no operator infrastructure operator will willy-nilly just try to duplicate infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, it is not worth it. There's so much space still to dig, it's not down there. Obviously, there's certain routes, core routes in, in the metro that you need to build. I mean, you need to have it, and, and yes, there, there, there can be the so-called co-built thing. I think that's, that's also where municipalities can play a major role when they refurbish or re uh, rehabilitate roads and things is to start and when they build new roads to make sure there's adequate sleeves. I mean a sleeve costs almost nothing in compared to a road thing to put sleeves and crossings in and so on and maybe rent that duck space out. Yeah. But now they're trying to get the the, 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 the top of the end so they want the fiber in and they want the service and they want that and I mean their expertise lies them to to, to manage and maintain pipes. Yeah. And, and there yeah. is a good revenue pot potential for them in the south. So, but uh, if an operator goes out and saturate the fiber, do deep fiber penetration, uh, I don't know from uh, the other operators, but I think most of them look, have information where operators and will not willingly just overrun uh, 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 other operator. It happens. I mean, I you yeah, cannot say it does not happen, but uh, so so if there's adequate space in the place, I, it should not be a problem. Yeah, but competition course, currently is not on the layer one. Competition is on the layer two and layer yeah. Yeah. three. Yeah. Also, yeah. Just to add on to that is that I don't think there is a single operator or a network provider that has a bottomless pit of money to just uh, whenever someone sends a letter to say we're building in this area and they go running and build in the exact same area. It depends mm -hmm. on what is your strategy at the time. Are you busy, are you focused on, uh, on, on, on OSPs or, or uh, ISPs at, the, mm -hmm. at that time? So I can't change my strategy because um, liquid or, or, or open serve is building in this area. I need to follow the strategy. No, that's a very good point. And I think if we just, we've got about 10 minutes or so, so I mean, if we just, just take a look at the asset, last aspect, because really that's the home connect. And, and I think the biggest challenge, personally, that I see, but then I'm biased because I sell these solutions,
But I think the biggest challenge that I see in the market is once you've done the build, and let's be honest, you've done a lot of that OSP and a lot of the big fiber is now in the ground. The revenue then comes by connecting the customers. Rowan's revenue will come with the over-the-top services. You guys will be making money, or you two will certainly be making money when you make the connections. We hear a lot of the skills, and I think we've talked to the challenge of, of having the right skill set here in South Africa. How do you, each of you, I guess, in a minute or two, how would you address the concern of, of delivering then a high capacity, high solution, or, or high quality solution in a cost-effective manner for that last connection? Maybe Rowan starts and we'll work back. That's a big challenge for us. There's a lot of networks where we operate, we have a right of way, not necessarily an ownership, because we deal with a, a levied solution where we have body corporates and homeowners associations and that type of thing. Some of them are very giving, they have budgets, and they say, okay, well, we will subsidize the Home Connect, and some don't. Some have been 10, 15, 20 years old, and you've got a home drop that's 150 meters. Mm -hmm. And to dig a trench that long is not effective, it's not cost effective to do that. So we look at models, we look at options, we say, okay, what is the best for the collective? Because you live in a gated estate because you want to live and be part of a community. So typically they end up making a decision that would be benefit the community. Um, not Everyone may not like it, but you also have to have choice. So if you want to connect, that's what the cost is. Are there variables, yes or no? Um, you're not forced to. Uh, obviously we'd like to try and have a minimum uptake if we can, and that's where the business models start uh, coming under pressure. But in terms of deploying quick and easy, unfortunately you cannot get away from digging that hole. Especially in the states where aesthetics is so critical and so sought after. You know, any state we have an aesthetics committee, don't even try and mount anything on the wall. It's just not going to help. Yeah, it's, you know, you, it's rose gardens and it's driveways and it's all these things and you know, that's yeah. your house type of thing. So getting away from that cost is, is, is costly but it's also until that port is lit, you cannot gener generate an income. You can have all the ISPs exactly. on the network in the world that you want. Yeah. If you don't have the eyeballs looking at that content, so at what point do you now say, okay, well, let's just go in and do it. Yeah. And then of course it gets bitty. So now you have one guy applies there, one guy applies there, one guy applies there. Mr. Homeowners Association, please, we're gonna do all these in one go. So we'll do a street at a time, whatever the case may be. Which comes back to your business case especially for your company. Correct. <laughs> Identifying the right estate with the right affluent market. To that's right. In. And the lights of the contractors, they don't want to do one house at a time. Of course they don't. Because they've got a team that's going to sit there for a week. So they're going to yeah. say, okay guys, let's go and do this all in one go. So it's a lot of organizing, it's a lot of planning, it's a lot of communication, and it's really just, it's the benefit for everybody. Let's dig it up once, then it's done. Yeah. And I think the, the, the bulls out in the suburbs is a similar setup. Once the reinstatement's in, uh, people are upset for three months when you do the big bolt. Six months later, the grass is grown back and we have a service and we carry on. But I mean, obviously, while you're in the middle of that, it's, it's, it's problematic. Yeah. So there isn't really a short or a long way. It's the way and it has to get done. But I think communication is key and it's education. There's only a certain way that you can do. There's only certain things that you can and can't. Um, and we just right. have to manage the process. Yeah, maybe if I, if I can say from the ins installation point of view, um, you know, the closer you get to the client, and I think this is what Ron is also getting to, the closer you get to the end user, the more fussy they are, and the more, uh, the more demanding they are, you know. So we found on the networking side, you know, you deal with, a, you, you deal with business, it's arranged, you know, the landlords. On the home side, you deal with the domestic, or you deal with uh, with the homeowner if it's not the Rodweiler. So um, it's, it's different challenges for different applications, I suppose. Um, but getting to the cost side, you know, we need to make it very cost effective for ourselves as well. So we need to, uh, there's a magic number of three to five houses per day, and if it's, if it's difficult, then you, know, and you need to come back, then you're not making money on a thousand or a thousand two hundred rand per home connect. Um, but that varies vastly as well. I mean, we've done some single homes connected in, for instance, Clifton, which is very close to 200,000. Mm. And that and that homes connect is paid by that single user. So um, that, that's by far not, not what we want in South Africa. I mean, we want to deploy as quickly as we can to everybody at the most cost-effective way. Otherwise, we're not going to get the uptake we want. Yeah. Um, but from our point of view, different applications for, for, for various um, installations on the network. Yeah, very true. I know Eugene is a, is a 
a big user of my PPC product, so maybe Eugene, you're, you're perfectly placed <laughs> to answer this one. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's horses for courses. Um, our philosophy is basically where we go into a total new build for complex estate or whatever, there's a massive drive to, to during the project phase to actually run a promotion where we don't ask the customer's money to put the, the drop in, even if they take a service or not a service. Uh, our philosophy is they will take a service later, or so the next owner will take So will take you take the service. service all the way to in, into the house? Into or the house, the into box? physically into the house. We put a termination point for the fiber into We just don't install a CPE device yeah. in there until there's an order. And do you build that into your model then? Into, into we your build it into our that? model and we, we do that. And basically the, the, to the owners, as we say, during this process, you can get it free. After this process, there's a standard mm -hmm. installation fee that you will need to pay. So you're taking that obstacle completely out yeah. of the way. So, uh, so, so sometimes we're quite successful, other times we're not successful. One of the estates, you get over 90% mm -hmm. of the termination, which if you do your calculations on your model and so on, the service activation is immediately 24 hours or yeah. something like so that. So the revenue is on board straight away. So, so and, and, and that's, that is things that is for a user very important, quick as a service, how fast and so on. Yeah. So that is a, obviously in new developments, it's a little bit easier. I mean, if you deal with the property developers, you make sure that all the, the part of the design, we're quite involved with the design teams, the architectural teams and the engineers, to make sure that the conduits and the, four by four boxes is installed where they should be in the yeah. houses and so on, which makes it, that's where your product comes quite well. There's a push through down Thank you, Jane. And so on. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we look also to the, to, to, to the technologies that's coming up with pre-connectorized and pre-terminated type of drop leads that we can use. We have a lot of plans. All of them is not yet in place, but, uh, uh, we cater for, for aerial drops, for drops uh, where we have to trench and yeah. so on. Obviously, it's relaxed trenching. And uh, even thinking of uh, self-built, do-it-yourself type of kits. Yeah, it's often been and, and, uh, thrown around, and isn't it? Yeah. I believe in Sweden it's being done, and they, uh, the network operator comes through, and you can, if you want a service, you go and buy a, buy a predetermined, or uh, a kit and you yeah. install it yourself, they came to thing and apparently you can deduct it from their tax. Yeah. That's, uh, that's correct. <laughs> that's a good model. Yeah. Can we now finish this off? I think um, with the, the one FTTH, uh, FTTH project that we actually did being Parkview, uh, we took a different approach. We, uh, we decided we would drop a pop at uh, each gate and then um, it will be the homeowner's <coughs> responsibility then to pull whatever it is uh, to the home. Um, and that, that, by doing that, I think we alleviated a lot of the headaches that, uh, that uh, you guys have, have uh, come up with. But uh, on a FTTB uh, perspective, we, so we, greenfields, I mean, everybody would love greenfields. Yeah, of course. So um, in a greenfield, we'd put an aggregation node in a, in a shopping center, and yes, we'd contract someone else to come and um, do the reticulation and things like that. Um, and, uh, but our business, yes, is, is, is geared differently to, to, to uh, my colleagues over here, where we we build more on a backhaul, right? So, um, and being on that backhaul, we go into different communities, that um, different communities, and being in those communities, I think an important factor to 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 bring up is the fact that uh, being able to utilize people from those communities in order to assist in building that infrastructure, I think um, is a great example of how to upskill people um, 
train the local empowerment. Yes, yeah. so yeah. local yeah. empowerment, SMME development. Yeah, of course. Um, those are ways of, of upskilling. I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, if, uh, if you teach someone uh, fiber optic training, you're giving them a skill that they can go and sell, for instance, to another country. Uh, you're not only giving them the skill to trench uh, a, a, a line from here and then close it up. But they can then go and sell that skill to maybe another underdeveloped country. Yeah. Um, he can go from here to uh, Mozambique or wherever else where the skill is needed and, and, and go and sell his skill. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're almost out of time. So I think just, just, just to wrap up and then maybe take a question if we have time for, for one. I, I think the challenges seem quite great and, and as a mediator is fairly neutral in all this. I, I think the, the need for legislation in contractors and, and way leave seems to be the message that would resonate through and each of the guys here has got a unique experience of doing those networks and, and doing them successfully. I mean, I think we'd all argue that you've all done successful networks, so it is plausible, but it, but it sounds like it's becoming more of a challenge in terms of access and build than perhaps it was a couple of years ago. So if we have time for a question, we'll maybe just take one or two. If not, well, I know Mr. Patrick is very keen to share his 10 years of knowledge with us all. Thanks, Andre Hoffman. Just a quick question. All you guys have quite a significant investment in uh, homes past. What is your experience on take-up, uh, on launch, and how does that change over the first 12 to 24 months? And what would you say your median service bandwidth is in these estates, in terms of megabits? Good question. Rowan, maybe you can take it from an estate perspective. Uh, yeah, we... Typically, from a take-up point of view, we, we try and aim for a 25 or a 30 percent. If the model doesn't work on anything more than that, then it becomes a bit of a challenge. But uh, typically, because of the agreements that we set and trying to get those models to work, um, we find the uptake's normally between 40 and 50 percent. So we've got a very good success ratio there. And you pay back on that, that sort of uptake? It really depends. It's on the ROI. It depends on how the bill gets done. It's we try and minimise it and try and do it within sort of 24 to, to 30 months. Yeah. Um, but again, it's it really just it's because we tailor make the solution. If I can put it that way, there's not a one size fits all. Uh, every estate is unique. Um, every we've got MDUs, we've got freestanding houses. There's there's a whole range of different things. And typically, what are you finding, I think, the, the, the latter part was in terms of bandwidth, what are you having to give to each of the estate holders? Typically, we normally give something for free, if you will, as part of a contribution, if you will. And in where the markets where we operate, we're one of the few networks that offer a 3 meg all up to 150 meg. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to cater for a wide range, and those port fees do not increase exponentially. Okay. So typically, a service anywhere from 400 rand up to 1,500 rand, it really just depends on the, on the ISP. Yeah. So we typically find the medium is sort of on a 10 meg, that's where people want to be, but we have a range of different type of users. Some guys only want a 3 or a 5 or a 4 meg, or whatever yeah. the case may be. But the, the average is sort of in, a, in, in the 10 range. We're a bit different where we don't offer a 20, we offer a 25. Okay. So typically we find that between a 10 and a 25, you've got your bandwidth hogs that'll take 100 or 100. Your yeah. 200 megs, yeah. uh, but that typically doesn't last very long. You know, the, the novelty wears off after a while, and people end up going back down again. So, if you can deliver a quality service, you don't need to have all these massive big lines because you're not feeling the contention ratio. Um, it's really just about getting that service in and delivering the service over the ISPs. And does that differ for you, Eugene? Uh, I think more as an operator perspective from from an MFN. Do you look at a bigger uptake, or do your sales guys go out there and yeah, pre-populate? Uh, Basically, how we look at it is, is, is we identify an area, if we go into an area, which can be anything from 1,000, 2,000, whatever is the number, build a business case around that and so on, and then divide it into the separate entities. The separate entities, obviously, there's, that doesn't make the terms, but you can't build an area and leave seven, a, a small estate of seven out, which will never make money. Yeah, but in the greater scheme of things, it is, is, is it our typical ROI 
why it's also 30 months, 36 months, yeah. looking at that sort of thing. That's not taking into account the back or cost and that sort of thing. Yeah, of but if we're looking at separate estates, uh, yes. Uh, we, we Originally, that's how it started. You looked at the single place and go for it and so forth. In, uh, from our data, it shows that 25% to 30% is a good take-up initially in the first three, four months, growing over 36 months to say about 55, 60%. Yeah. I believe that uh, in five, six years, and there's no data to support that at this stage, but five years to 10 years, it will be 80, 90% take It will become a utility in the end. It has yeah, to become an that's activity, it will be there. So, yeah. so I think that is the important thing, is this. Put, put fiber in, it will be there in 20 years' time. Yeah. It will be used. Great. Okay. Um, anything else from the, from the floor before we pass over? Super. In which case, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to us. And uh, over to Patrick to clear off out of the country next year. Thank you.